In the latter half of 1888, London was gripped by fear when five women were murdered within a few months of each other in the east end of the city. Initially dubbed the Whitechapel Murders after the district where most of the killings took place, they are better known today by the sensational title of the Jack the Ripper Murders. Over the past century, the case has become without doubt the most famous serial killings in history. However, the victims have been largely forgotten. The identity of the killer, frequently cast as an evil genius, dominates the seemingly endless retellings of the murders, both in fact and fiction. However, in 2019, this changed when Halle Rubenhold published a book called The Five, The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper. This upended the traditional understandings of the case because the book doesn't really focus on the murders and rarely mentions Jack the Ripper, but instead, as the title suggests, it focuses on the lives of the women who were killed. Through this approach, Halley gained a fresh perspective on the case. She challenged century-old claims like the assertion that all the victims were sex workers. In the course of her research, she also revealed how the victims' lives and the wider story was entangled with that of the Irish community in London. After listening to the book back in 2019, I interviewed Halley for a show that was released over four years ago, but it remains one of my favourite interviews. Halley has really fascinating insights, not only on the Jack the Ripper case, but also how we view murder in general. Now, given I was in a studio all last week recording my own upcoming book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders, I didn't have time to prepare a new episode. But given this show on the Irish connections to the Jack the Ripper case is definitely worth listening to again, I decided to re-edit and re-release it again. Just before we dive in, for first-time listeners, my name is Finn Dwyer and this is the Irish History Podcast. If you look at the show notes below, you'll notice a link to Eason's Bookshop. That's where you can pre-order that book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland and 18 Murders, today. And if you use the coupon code FD10 at Eason's, you'll get 10% off. So don't wait around until the book is released in September and pay the full price. Use that code FD10 today when you pre-order and you'll get 10% off. Sound on the episode is by Kate Dunley. Now to the interview. I began the conversation with Hallie by asking her for an overview of the Jack the Ripper murders. You're probably familiar with them, but given they've been surrounded by endless theorising and even conspiracies since they took place, I thought it was worth getting Hallie to set out the facts. So the murders committed by the malefactor, otherwise known as Jack the Ripper, it's generally agreed upon, were committed between the 31st of August and the 9th of November, 1888. And it is also generally agreed that there were five women who were killed in that time. And the first one was Marianne or Polly Nichols. The second was Annie Chapman. The third was Elizabeth Stride. The fourth was Catherine Eddowes. And the fifth was Mary Jane Kelly. And all of these took place, with the exception of the murder of Catherine Eddowes, within, actually within Whitechapel. And Catherine Eddowes was murdered just over the line in, in the boundaries of the uh, City of London. But all of them, at the very end of their lives lived in this part of of Whitechapel, though that is certainly not where they all started their lives. Jack the Ripper was never caught. He was never brought to trial. And so the mystery of who he was continues to persist. And it's something that we as a culture have been obsessed with for nearly 131 years. The story of the murders tends to focus on their brutality and the horrific mutilation of the women at the expense of actual historical detail. Now, Haley's book provides a fascinating backdrop to life in the Whitechapel area of London, a poor working class community. She explains how Irish emigrants were very much part of the backdrop to this story and indeed wider life in London in the 1880s. The Irish really started immigrating to London in the 18th century. England was full of Irish, but 
particularly London, you know, I mean, the cultural life in London, you know, a lot of the, the playwrights, the actors, not to mention quite a lot of the servant class, the working class, were composed of, of a lot of Irish immigrants. And obviously the Irish kept coming throughout the 19th century, certainly after the, the famine and during the famine, you know, it, that that was a massive time of, of Irish immigration. And, and yes, they were part of this very rich tapestry of of life and working class life and that isn't to say that many Irish people didn't you know scale the heights and or you know enter into the middle classes and and a lot of people who who immigrated actually were middle class as well. The story of these murders is a story of poor working class women. I asked Haley to paint a picture of general life for women in these communities and what brought them to Whitechapel in 1888. I mean, this is, you know, obviously Victorian life was incredibly precarious, especially if you were poor. But for most people, it was precarious. And especially if you're a woman, it was very precarious because there were so many rules that society placed around you that you had to navigate around in order to have a respectable life. And circumstances made it very difficult for women always to stick to those rules. You know, this idea that, you know, really that in order for a woman to have a function in life, she had to be a wife and a mother. You know, that was a woman's function. That was really the only career that was considered open to her. And if she had failed at that, if she had proven herself to be a bad mother or a bad wife or she failed to get married or she had sex outside of marriage or any of these things you know society saw her as a complete failure and you know life was very difficult you know you have to think that women's work didn't pay well at all and it was designed not to pay well because women were not meant to be the breadwinners they were only meant to augment a family's income so if a woman found herself alone if her husband died or if he abandoned her or she found herself single and, you know, with with a child, she couldn't, it was incredibly difficult for her to support that family or to support herself without the assistance of a man. You know, so she then had to enter into all sorts of what would be considered illicit attachments to men, you know, and then she experiences the society's scorn and the moral degradation. You know, there's no getting around it. You know, the, just the, 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 the deck was stacked against women, no matter which way you turned. Next, I asked Haley to talk about one of these women in particular, Catherine Eddowes, who was murdered on September the 30th, 1888, becoming the fourth victim. Her story is not only representative of the difficulties many of the other victims faced, but her life is heavily interwoven with that of an Irish famine emigrant, Thomas Conway. Well, I mean, she led a life which was quite, I think, divergent from what would be expected of of women at that time, working class women. Just very briefly, I mean, her father was a union agitator in Wolverhampton. And he got himself into some trouble during the 1840s, during a lot of industrial unrest, and moved the family to London. And then when she was a young teenager, her parents both died of tuberculosis, and she was sent back to the Midlands, back to Wolverhampton, to live with her extended family, who she really didn't know at all. And she worked in a factory and hated it and ran away and then ran off to live with her uncle in Birmingham and found life much the same. And then when she was living in Birmingham, she met up with a man who was traveling salesman of ballads and what are called chat books. So little kind of readers, little books that peddlers sold, little story books. And his name was Thomas Conway. And Thomas Conway was was Irish. He was from County Mayo. He had come over during the famine and he had lived for some time in Yorkshire, in Beverly, around Hull, took the Queen's shilling and joined the army and ended up being sent to to India during the to help put down what was called the Sepoy Mutiny and was in such poor health that he ended up spending a lot of that time in a hospital in Madras and then coming back to England and being discharged. And he was unfit for service because he had very poor chest. It's, you know, they didn't know what asthma was at the time. And quite often it was it was diagnosed as um, rheumatism. And it's, it's possible he was asthmatic. 
which meant that he couldn't take on heavy lifting and, you know, the sort of work that laborers would be doing. And, you know, he was uneducated. He couldn't write his name. We don't know if he could read or not because reading and writing were often taught separately. But one of the jobs that was available to men like him was as a a traveling ballad salesman or a traveling, an itinerant travel salesman of all sorts of things, chapbooks and When you sell chapbooks, you're also selling other things, you know, buttons and scissors and thimbles and things that women who live in farmhouses, wives would use. And these people would travel the country selling all sorts of things and they go to hangings and they go to taverns. And and that's how he ended up meeting Catherine Eddowes, who joined up with him and left factory work behind. And the two of them tramped the roads together. Quite literally, they tramped. That's what tramping was. They tramped the roads together all over England, the Midlands, a bit of the north, and then eventually came down south. But the interesting thing was, I mentioned he was illiterate, and but Catherine wasn't illiterate. She had been given an education at a charity school in London, and she could read and she could write, and she'd been taught music. So it's interestingly, one of the things I found was that it was always said that he wrote these ballads, and he wrote ballads and he sold them and they performed them, which is how you sold your ballads. But um, it would have been Catherine who was writing down these ballads. They may have composed them together, but it was certainly she was the one who was writing them down. While this life on the road is sometimes portrayed as romantic, this wasn't the case. Indeed, it was this life that saw Catherine pushed further to the margins and into extreme poverty. Whichever option you chose when you were poor it was never a good one. So, you know, this you're right, you know, this kind of itinerant life was very romanticised, but the realities were you know, pretty bloody awful. You know, you're sleeping outside in a ditch quite a lot of the time. And when the weather's bad, you, you know, you can go into a casual ward at a workhouse. But I mean, the workhouses were horrific places. And, you know, Catherine found that she had to give birth in a workhouse infirmary. And, you know, these were extremely unsanitary, uh, just filthy places, you know, where a pregnant woman was um, given a bed next to somebody with, you know, some contagious disease and um, the toilets were overflowing and, you know, they didn't really understand bacteria that well at that time, how it worked, you know, and it, it was it was a it was a terrible life. You didn't know when you were going to eat next. You didn't know where you were going to sleep next. People got tired. People got sick. It's raining. It's snowing. You're on the road. You know, it's it's not a romantic life. Conway and Edwards would eventually settle in London. But their relationship was extremely abusive and Catherine, or Kate as she was known, developed an increasingly problematic drinking habit. By 1888, she and Conway had split up and Catherine, remaining in poverty, lived with a man called John Kelly. Extremely poor, the two could not always afford accommodation and she left Kelly on the night of the 29th of September 1888 looking for somewhere to sleep. She was found horrifically murdered in the following hours. While Catherine was the fourth victim, the last and final victim is perhaps the best known Irish connection to the case. Mary Jane Kelly is frequently said to have been from Limerick. However, in her research Haley suggests Mary Jane may not have been Irish at all and in fact is a somewhat mysterious figure who may well have come from a wealthy background originally. You know, she is completely enigmatic and, you know, it's very frustrating to try to get any sort of purchase on who she was. Because Mary Jane, it seems, told different people different things about who she was. And then the way in which she behaved and her her outward behavior kind of betrayed some other aspect of her background as well. So, for example, you know, what we know largely about Mary Jane came from her live-in boyfriend of a couple of years who was called Joseph Barnett. And obviously what she was telling him, you know, may not have been entirely the truth. And also he's paraphrasing and there may be things he didn't understand and things he interpreted a certain way. And then we have some testimony and also um, interviews with women who had been her madams at various places where she had worked in London. What we know about her usually comes through these testimonies, but it is almost certain that her name was not Mary Jane Kelly all of her life because a lot of research has been done on her and nobody has been able to find a Mary Jane Kelly that fits the the descriptions that she gave of, of her life. 
she is said to have originally or her family had come from Limerick and they moved to Wales and they'd lived for some time in Cardiff. She claims to have lived in Carmarthenshire or Carnarvon at some point. It's uncertain which. And at some point she claims to have married a miner whose surname was Davies. Obviously, that's, you know, as common as Smith in in Wales. And he died in a mine explosion. And absolutely none of these things have been verified. We don't even know an actual date of birth for her. But what we do know is that at some point, Mary Jane came to London. Interestingly enough, she went right into high class sex work. From the work I've done and my a lot of my my past work has been in studying history of prostitution. And there are certain patterns in prostitution that seem to be consistent throughout the 18th and 19th and into the 20th, early 20th century. And that is, you don't just wake up one day and find yourself in high class prostitution, that you have to get there in the same way that people rise and fall in society. Such was the case with sex work. In, in the 18th and 19th centuries as well. Mary Jane would have had to have had something which made her presentable, something which gave her a veneer of, of polish. Often young women who went into sex work in the upper echelons had some sort of education. They came from the middle classes. And Mary Jane Kelly certainly, from what other people said about observing her, and this is where you can't hide your 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 class background. It's very difficult to hide an education in the 19th century. And Mary Jane Kelly, people who lived with her, her madams had said that she was a woman who had been had some degree of education. And in fact, very interestingly, that she was an artist of no mean degree. Well, art was only taught in girls' schools, middle-class and upper-class girls' schools at this time. And certainly a working-class girl from a poor family would have had no access at all, even to the materials to learn how to draw or paint or whatever. But she had some sort of artistic talent, the way she conducted herself, the way she held herself, the way she spoke. She spoke with no accent, no discernible accent at all. And we know she worked in high-class prostitution and she went to Paris. A gentleman took her around in carriages and she had very expensive dresses and we also know that it seems almost I would say certainly from the the evidence that has been left behind that that she was trafficked to Paris and was able to escape it's possible that she had some command of French and if you had some command of French you could report what had happened to the prostitution police and they were under obligation to let you go but when she came back to London she did not go back to the West End to Knightsbridge where she lived or to Piccadilly where she practiced she went um, basically into hiding in uh, Whitechapel and she lived off of the Radcliffe Highway and that was very very unusual because the way high class prostitution operated in the West End is that you had any number of other houses you could go to, women you could call on who were who were madams or clients even. Everyone, you know, you were never completely isolated. So the fact that she didn't go back to high class prostitution, but instead went to the very lowest end really demonstrated she was hiding from somebody. We also know that a man came looking for her at one point and she was hiding from him. So that's all interesting. And and my guess is that it was then when she came back from Paris and she went into hiding that she changed her name from whatever it was before to Mary Jane Kelly. Kelly being obviously such a, you know, a common Irish surname, almost like Davis is in in um in Wales or Smith is in England. You know, if somebody comes looking for you and I'm looking for a girl called Mary Kelly, well, good luck finding somebody called Mary Kelly in the East End of London in the late 19th century. So it was it was it was probably down to that. And you know, she invented part of her past. She wanted to fit in. She wanted to you know not seem like anybody exceptional. I believe almost certainly where that identity came from. Mary Jane Kelly was murdered on November the 9th, 1888. One of the most well-known aspects of the case is the claim that Jack the Ripper targeted sex workers on the streets of Victorian London. While Mary Jane was a sex worker, Haley's research has challenged the idea that all the victims were. She now explains 
that this was a label given to many women who lived on the margins of Victorian society. I, you know, the, the Victorians, obviously, as a woman, it, it's it's hard to fall any further than to become what the Victorians would call a prostitute, you know, you know, because that was the ultimate expression of a woman really having failed in her duties to society. You know, she wasn't she was thought to be unclean, both physically and morally. And so one of the problems, certainly, with the way in which these women were perceived, these women by which I mean the five victims, is that all five of these victim, victims had failed as women. They were what we would say broken women. They, they had somehow kind of not lived up to the ideal. So, for example, you know, if you were an alcoholic, if, for example, you had mental problems, if you were separated from your family, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't have a roof to live under, if you weren't married, if, all of these things, these, these would be considered broken women. A fallen woman is, is also a woman who is ruined, but she's sexually ruined, but she's also morally ruined. And Victorian society conflated these two things, because if you're a broken woman, it's like a half step to being a fallen woman. And often broken women were fallen women. So, you know, in the case of somebody like Annie Chapman, you know, Annie Chapman was an alcoholic. I mean, she really suffered and she had inherited the disease from her father. And Annie had had you know, quite a decent life in her Husband was a coach driver for a gentleman, and she lived in a country estate outside of Windsor. And however, you know, she'd gone into rehab for a year, one of the first women's rehabilitation centers. But, you know, she could not, she could not overcome the disease. And so she and her husband separated. Well, that's a broken woman. And the problem is because, you know, it was almost impossible for a woman to live a single life at that time. I mean, it was it was anathema that people would be single in the Victorian era. Women needed men and men needed women. Uh, such was the division of labor that she then found herself, ha you know, living with another man and forming another partnership as, as we would today if we got separated. But because of that, she was committing adultery. She was an adulteress. So therefore, she was a fallen woman. So therefore, not only was she a broken woman, she was a fallen woman. She was completely ruined. And society would have heaped on her all of this scorn and shame for having done this, having become something which was really beyond her control. And, and so you can see how it would be easy for society just to then conflate these women's, what they would call crimes, into one big mass of crime, which was, you know, prostitute, fallen woman. If the murderer was not targeting the women because they were sex workers, the question remains why he attacked these women. Most narratives present Jack the Ripper as a criminal mastermind who was able to somehow murder these women in what was a busy neighbourhood without anyone catching him. Haley challenges this assertion and presents the most logical theory that he preyed on the women as they slept. I mean, I think one of the things that has been really overlooked is the fact that all of these women, well, most of these women had histories of rough sleeping where Annie Chapman was killed. I mean, the, I think it was the day after they cleared the body away. A man was found sleeping in that exact same position where she was found. And that area where she slept in was known as a place rough sleepers slept. Catherine Eddowes was, was known as, I mean, she slept rough for almost more than half of her life. And not only that, but several women came forward after her murder to say, oh, I know her. She, she sleeps rough with us. You know, Polly Nichols slept, slept rough. You know, she was picked up in Trafalgar Square for sleeping rough. You know, it's, it, it's just ridiculous that, I mean, there is, there is no evidence that Jack Ripper had sex at all with his victims. It, it seems so obvious when London at this time was full of rough sleepers. And we know these women didn't have, these three women that I mentioned, didn't have money for their DOS that night at all and were out on the streets. You know, and and this kind of belief that they were prostitutes. And then obviously, you know, Mary Jane Kelly was killed in her bed. She was the last one. Of course, he would have changed his his modus operandi. 
when everybody was looking for him. So it made sense to kill indoors. It just, you know, I mean, the kind of disbelief, this fury that I'm getting from the Ripperology community that I would even suggest this, you know, that is absolutely preposterous. What is preposterous is not actually questioning any of the evidence which they haven't done that these women were prostitutes. You know, it, this this idea that somehow something's written in a police report, it has to be true when n- nothing else stacks up around it. And it, it's like it's gospel, you know, and they are absolutely, I think, terrified of considering an alternative to this because it would overturn, you know, years and years of their their machinating and their 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 putting together theories and their their discussions and you know and they feel the sense of ownership over the story and so they're not willing to contemplate this i think it makes much more sense than to suggest they were sex workers because there is absolutely no evidence in the case of these three women that there was i mean it's circumstantial and there's plenty of evidence to the contrary that they were sex workers as well like such as their death certificates you know the only person who was called a prostitute on her death certificate is Mary Jane Kelly for whom we have a very long trail of evidence that that all stacks up the others are not called the prostitutes well why wouldn't that be when you know the inquest has heard all of the information about who these women were what they were doing and and then write up the death certificates after they hear all this information and decided that they couldn't be called that. It just seems preposterous to me, basically. Finally, I couldn't finish the interview without asking Haley about the book's conclusion. The conclusion of The Five is one of the best I've ever come across. Rather than just summarise the argument, it questions if our attitudes have changed much since the 1880s and makes us really think about how we, as a society today, treat similar cases. Recently, there was a documentary about the Yorkshire Ripper and basically Liza Williams, who did this uh, documentary, who she was the director and um, she she made it, basically said that the reason why the Yorkshire Ripper wasn't caught was pretty much the same reasons that the, you know, that Jack the Ripper wasn't caught was because the police were looking for a killer of prostitutes. You know, this belief that any woman out on the street at night was a bad woman. You know, and that prostitutes are bad women, you know, that there are bad women and somehow bad women deserve to die. Bad women get what they deserve. We may not recognize this in ourselves, but a lot of these beliefs are so deeply entrenched in our society. So that, for example, recently, I think the the case that you were referring to that I mentioned in, in my conclusion is the Suffolk Strangler case. And the judge at the summing up of that, and this was, I believe it was 2007, I think, felt compelled to tell the jury, to remind the jury that they had to lay aside their prejudices because the women who were killed were believed to be sex workers and that it didn't matter what their lifestyle was and it didn't matter what drugs they took and it didn't matter what they drank or what they did that at the end of the day, these women did not deserve to be murdered. And the fact that he had to tell the jury this in the 21st century, I think, is pretty, pretty shocking. But it says everything. It says that, you know, these beliefs are still with us and they still persist. And we carry them inside ourselves, many of us. And, you know, it really surprised me doing this work. Also, how adamant so many people are that Jack the Ripper killed prostitutes. Jack the Ripper had to kill prostitutes. They were prostitutes. And just this ad- adherence to this narrative and an unwillingness to change, you know, I think it says a lot about us. Before we finish, I want to thank Hallie for her time. You can find links to her book, The Five, in the show notes. Don't forget to pre-order your copy of Elita Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders in the show notes as well. And if you pre-order at Eason's, you'll get 10% off when you use the coupon code FD10. Next week, I'll be back with the history of a village that experienced one of the largest population drops in Ireland in the 19th century. And it's not related to the Great Hunger. That's a great story. Until then, Sloan. Sloan.